सर सामने सामने एकदम बेटा करण सर यहाँ पे देखिए निधि निधि साइड दो निधि साइड दो निधि साइड पराग साइड निधि साइड सर 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 फोटो दे सर सर फोटो दे फोटो सर सर एक फोटो सर 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 फोटो दे फोटो सर 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 अरे कितना आगे जा रहे हैं यार अरे मागे है यार एवरी नागे है यार अरे पीछे रो पीछे रो पीछे रो सब लोग पीछे रो पीछे आ जाओ हाँ तो एक फोटो सर इस आपको अरे फ्लैश फ्लैश 
जय मम जय मम जय जय मम सोता थोड़ा साइड Hi and good evening, and a very warm welcome to all of you. We have friends and family of Shweta's in the house, and this is a wonderful, wonderful house full of love. So I have to say that I invited myself to host the proceedings. Shweta is very shy and never likes to ask anyone to do anything for her. But I invited myself because I'm mainly a host and I just direct whenever I get some free time. And so I decided to do this because I love and adore Shweta and I have grown up with her. Both of us grew up and we were we got really close as children because we had one common factor. that was the bullying of abhishek we were both bullied though we were both much older than abhishek was and i think uh, aunty jay will tell us more stories and what she might remember but i remember that we actually bonded when we were both tied to a tree trunk um well while the others were playing why we were tied to that tree, tree trunk only abhishek will be able to tell you and when i turned up to shweta's birthday party in a superman costume though there was no theme that particular day uh my mother of course was misinformed and sent me looking like superman so i have many many memories of shweta but what i do know about shweta is that she is an exceptional exceptional talent she's always stayed away from the spotlight though everyone who's close to her and knows her well knows that possibly the best actor in the family is shweta her ability to <laughs> her ability to tell a story her ability to narrate an incident her ability to mimic many many leading lights of the film industry which they may never know of or never see because shweta is that shy but i always knew that she was talented exceptionally astute amazingly observant and actually has a sense and an ability to write so beautifully that i knew and i was not surprised the day i knew that she turned columnist and then finally she turned author when i read paradise towers i knew that it was really a huge loaf of life not just a slice but a loaf of life everything that she keenly observed having lived in delhi having lived in mumbai having traveled the world and mainly the way she addresses the characters the way she actually points the nuances of human behavior is all there apart from that her exceptional wit and her storytelling expertise is all there for you to see Shweta I wish you all the best for your debut debut venture into the literary world and I'm sure that there will be many many more and you will do your father and your grandfather tremendously proud give it up for Shweta Bachananda ladies and gentlemen and of course who better than her iconic and legendary parents to do the honors today both of them leading lights of the film fraternity exceptional actors exceptional entertainers and possibly the most amazing people i know in the movies they are like parents to me and i'm very very grateful to have known them in my growing years ladies and gentlemen please welcome shweta's parents mr and mrs amita bachchan mr jay bachchan and mr amita bachchan on stage now that we have mommy and papa on stage we like the renaissance girl as i call her on stage the spotlight is all yours yes come
Shweta, come here. Okay. How nervous are we today? Very. You have anything else to add to that one word reply that you gave me, considering you're meant to be amazing with words? No, not right now. Not right now? All right, okay. Okay, we'd like to unveil the book, ladies and gentlemen, and for that, I would request Mr. and Mrs. Bachchan to please do the honors. Yes. It's there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well done, Shavana ji. We love you. Jayanti, I would love to ask you what you're feeling at this moment. She said, good Lord, before I gave you the mic. Good evening. Sorry for coming in late. Sorry, Shweta. Sorry, Karan. <laughs> we got held very badly in traffic. I knew she would, do, she would do this. Since she was a child, I knew she would someday write. Mother's instinct. <laughs> what else? <laughs> you just asked me one question. Oh, that's it. You have nothing else to add to that? <laughs> you knew she would write. Yes. Mother's instinct. That totally we all knew she would write. In fact, I was hoping that one day she'll act, but that won't happen. Actually, I, I, I think that she's very inspired by your screenplay writing. Oh, me? Yes. Because the way you detail your characters, I think that's what she's done in this book. I was actually quite surprised and I keep saying, Shweta, is this character that person we knew? Is this character? She says, no, mom, no, no. no, no she's, she's totally lying there, all real people. And she's just not telling us. She's inspired by many people and people perhaps is sitting in this room here. Uh, you'll never know, they may have found their way into her book. Even I feel some of the characters are very close to people that I think you and I both know. Yes. We'll discuss that later, Auntie Jeva. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Amit Uncle. May I please ask you what you're feeling at this moment? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having us here. It's a moment of great pride and honor. Very emotional for parents to be at the launch of their daughter's book. As a father, I feel very privileged because she's my daughter. And uh, daughters have a special place in my heart. I wish her all the very best. All I can say for the moment is I endorse what Karan said a little earlier on, that she really is the best actor in the family. Every time we uh, go through some kind of a, a moment in the day, uh, during any event, there's always a little family meeting at the end of the event at home. And uh, she takes over and does a take off on everyone that was present there. <laughs> Uh, I do look forward to this evening when she will do a takeoff on tonight's um, event. Uh, she's also very perceptive about uh, observation, and uh, I do rely on her many a times, as does the rest of the family, on uh, many incidents that may happen within the city, within the home, within the country, within the world. She has uh, an opinion. Many a times we discuss, uh, I do, um, the outcome of a film that I may have done or a film that she may have seen. And uh, I have to say that uh, she's always been right. 
when she says that a film is going to do well, it does well. When she says it's not going to do well, it, it turns out exactly right. So many a times uh, I have begun to share some of my scripts. Uh, I'm afraid I couldn't do many of them earlier on, and I, I want to be excused for that. But recently, though, she has been extremely helpful, very perceptive in giving me ideas and thoughts on what I was working on. I can only give you my love and my blessings, Shweta, and thank you so much, all of you, for being here today to encourage her to grow not just as my daughter, but as a woman and as a lady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amit Uncle. And may I also now please request you to read your favorite passage from the book for all of us. It would be an absolute honor. Thank you. Shweta asked me to uh, read certain portions of the, of the book. Uh, she wanted me to uh, read the, the prologue. I'll do a bit of that and then a small portion inside the book as well. So in a leafy Mumbai suburb, on the very turn of a U-bend, stood the handsome structure of Paradise Towers, a residential building built in the late 60s as the last word in modern convenience. By modern, the builders meant that it had an elevator with a designated liftman and a garden that most bungalows would be envious of with its designated gardener. Over the years, other more modern and loftier structures came up in the area, dwarfing paradise stars. However, none could compete with its clean lines, meticulous planning, which kept it from flooding during the rains or its residence. The building stood a few meters from the beach, and depending on the time of day, it, it, it enjoyed either a balmy, balmy breeze or the stench of drying fish. The road it stood on was more a by-lane that rarely saw any traffic besides the random vegetable vendor and fisherwoman who, with their baskets on their head, crossed over to their fishing village via the building twice a day. The facade of the building was vanilla white and got a new coat of paint every five years. On it was painted in bold brick red letters, Paradise Towers, vertically, with the S in the towers dangling just above the balcony on the first floor. That was another one of its unique features, whereas the buildings around Paradise Towers were painted steel gray. The windows tinted black. Paradise Towers boasted a substantial balcony for every road-facing flat. It was a building law that the occupants were not allowed to hang their drying on the balcony. So as the years went on, it retained its aesthetic appeal while the places around it got cluttered and messy. The entrance was a wrought iron gate with arrowhead bars secured by a sickle lock mechanism. A smaller pedestrian gate was attached to it and was most often used by visitors and residents alike. A metal sheeted guard's cabin stood outside the gate, though its inhabitant preferred to sit outside it on a folding chair, his register and desk fan jostling for space on a rickety stool in front of him. A wide concrete driveway led to the ground floor where in the maze of pillars that defined the parking spots stood the elevator. A staircase right by the lift wound its way up the building, every even numbered set of stairs being followed by landing. The elevator was placed so that it divided every floor in two with a flat on each side and a small lobby in front of it. The staircase also allowed access to each floor and the substantial terrace accessible to and all used by the, everyone for the drying of clothes, housing of water tanks, and the electrical room, and where all the staff gathered to moan about salaries and to gossip. Rarely in the spring, the building children would go up there to fly kites, but as the years were on, the, mod, the more modern modes of play were invented, the children lost interest. The flats were spacious and airy with large windows that let in the sunlight, they each had a small kitchen, staff quarter adjacent to it, and two bedrooms. 
The garden downstairs was lush and lined with bougainvillea creepers on the boundary wall, which spilled onto the road, shedding petals and carpeting the street pink. Well-tended flower beds with seasonal flowers ran all over the circumference of the garden, breaking only at its entrance, and a mud path ran alongside for those who wanted to walk. Palm trees flanked the driveway on one side, and there were talks of installing a water fountain, which was then scrapped in favor of leaving the driveway with a roundabout used for potted plants and a seating spot for the maids to keep an eye on their wards who often played in the garden. The residents of Paradise Stars were an amenable bunch. They all interacted with each other and the children were constantly in and out of one another's flats. The women had a committee which organized Diwali and Christmas parties yearly and once even a 70th birthday party. They were fast friends and sworn enemies, but seldom any grave unpleasantness. Nothing dramatic ever happened at Paradise Stars, or so you might think. Of course, appearances can be very deceptive. So that was the prologue to the book, and there's a little small chapter on one of the elements that stayed in Paradise Pass. So, Dinesh's vacant spot in the car park was soon occupied by a bicycle superfluously trilling its bell as Mr. Roy, his mop of wiry black hair ruffled by the wind and thick black square-framed spectacles balanced on the tip of his nose that he peered over, swerved into place. Dismounting his cycle with some difficulty, seeing as he had weighed uh, under his arm a briefcase, Mr. Roy parked his ride, smoothed his clothes and hair by running a hand over them, pushed his spectacles back up his nose, and proceeded to remove something wrapped in layers of newspaper from the basket attached to the front of his cycle. From the shadows, a middle-aged man came forward and relieved Mr. Roy of his briefcase leaving the gentleman to better hold his newspaper wrapped parcel. Though the Roys had a car, Mr. Roy preferred to use his bicycle on trips to the fish market, or so he told his friends. The truth, however, was that he had once driven himself into the gutter right outside the building. A nostalgic song on the radio had set him off daydreaming, causing him to lose control of his car. The car and Mr. Roy were extricated from the gutter with great difficulty. One of the Kapoor children had even captured the entire episode on their phone. The car, though, sent for an overhaul, would always smell of rotting bananas every time the engine overheated. Mrs. Roy had ever since forbidden her husband from driving the car when he was on his own, and so Mr. Roy had resorted to using his bicycle for most errands. Mr. Roy rung for the elevator, that whirred and hummed as it descended, the, the lift man smiling, his broad smile, as he came into view. The grill of the elevator drawn open, the lift man greeted his passenger, who once ensconced in the lift became the subject of his over-familiar repartee. Fresh fish for dinner today, Sabji, he asked, eyeing the parcel that Mr. Roy was now cradling in his arms. Mr. Roy gave him a perfunctory smile that should have indicated to the liftman that he found his questioning impertinent, but in this case managed only to encourage him. When I was in my village in Bihar, the liftman prattled on, we knew many Bengali families. Nothing like homemade machir jol, Sarji. It had been an age since I have had the pleasure of eating such delicately prepared fish. Mr. Roy leaned forward, pressing the button to his floor, which in his enthusiasm the liftman had forgotten to push and the elevator began its labored climb to the second floor, where Mrs. Roy would be waiting to receive the fish that only her husband was trusted to select from the mongers, in lieu of which he would leave office early using a made-up physiotherapy appointment as his excuse. With a click and a jump, the elevator came to a halt on the fourth floor, where the middle-aged manservant, now divested of the briefcase, was waiting to open the elevator door and let his boss out. The minute he stepped onto the landing of the fourth floor, Mr. Roy's superior, all factory senses, picked up the most divine aroma. Tilting his head backwards, 
and flaring his nostrils, Mr. Roy shut his eyes, gave himself up entirely to the scent. He followed it as if in a trance, only to find his reverie broken when his nose smashed against the door of not his mighty establishment, but that of his neighbors, the Partails. Thank you, Amit Uncle. Thank you for doing the honors and thank you for reading that absolutely wonderful two passages actually from the book. Congratulations, Shweta. It truly reads so well, but that also has something to do with your illustrious father. Uh, I'm going to actually now turn the spotlight on Shweta and actually get her to do some talking about her journey, how it all happened. And for that, I would like to invite uh, critic, a filmmaker, and an author himself, the very prolific Raja Sen. <laughs> Shweta, one thing about you that everyone seems to know is that you read a lot. Words mean a lot to you. And so, your first book, you know, you're someone who does many things. You've been a columnist, you've just launched a you know, fashion label. Your first book, how momentous is this occasion for you? Is it, um, extremely, extremely momentous. Um, I can hardly believe it. <laughs> there are pros and cons of having your parents on stage with you. <laughs> Uh, you've dedicated Paradise Towers to your grandfathers, yes. to the poet Harivan Shraya Bachchan and to the journalist Tarun Kumar Bhadur. That's right. Uh, could you tell us a little more about uh, how these illustrious writers shaped you as a reader and as a writer? Um, so Raja, while growing up, we were always surrounded by literature. We were encouraged to read, not just by my grandfather, but also my grandmother. And there was always a huge influence of storytelling. Every night before we went to bed, my grandparents lived with us. And my brother and me would go to our daddy's room, and we would spend an hour there. And she would tell us stories, orally, of course. And um, we would be fascinated and ask for more. And she would continue to tell us stories till it was time to get to bed. And we grew up with a very strong influence of that. So it was a, a lot about storytelling. My grandfather on every birthday um, wrote us a poem to each of his six grandchildren on their separate birthdays in, as a gift. And, um, and my nana was um, very passionate and opinionated um, you know, about issues that were close to his heart. He was a very liberated man and he always encouraged women to you know, go out there and do something and make something of their lives, as he did with his three daughters. So I think it's a, it's a mix of both of these things. Um, Nana wrote mainly in Bengali, and I don't read it or write it, unfortunately, so I haven't been able to read his stuff. But they were always furiously scribbling away, both of them, whenever I visited them. Um, my dadaji every day, and Nana whenever we went over to meet him in Bhopal. So I think that left a huge impact in my mind. And, and that's why they are um, the people who I would dedicate my books to. <laughs> and where did the storytelling bug bite you? When did you, what did you remember the first thing you wrote? The, the first things I actually remember writing were get well soon cards to my father when he was recuperating after his accident on the sets of Cooley. Um, I, we weren't allowed to visit him, but uh, every Friday we would sit down and, and make cards. So we would write him little reassuring cards, I, telling him that don't worry, we're fine, we're studying hard, and get well soon, and come home soon. So that's the first thing I remember writing. And the idea of storytelling, like you know, just getting into the fact that, did you enjoy writing from that point on? I've always enjoyed writing, but for myself, it's very daunting writing for others. <laughs> you always like what you write. You can't say that about other people. 
Um, and I used to, I, I was always the eldest of the bunch, and I was always telling stories to all my younger cousins and my brother. So I think maybe that's where it came from. And who were your favorite writers growing up? Like, who were the influences on, on Paradise Towers, so to speak? Well, Jane Austen, because her characters were so vivid and, and so funny and just so precise. Even though we don't live in that age, she's fleshed them out so well that, you know, you know these people, you've seen these people, their little quirks, their foibles, their, you know, little tics, as you would say. So she is... Um, would be one of my hugest influences. And Dickens, he's done the same with his. Right. Writers that have stayed timeless, yes. really. Yes. It's also exciting that you've made your debut with not just a novel, but a, a book of humor, you know, which is, which is rarer. You know, we don't see that many fresh, funny voices. I think Odin would back me up on that. And, um, you know, this is exciting. Why did you choose humor? It, well, actually, it wasn't intentional. But if you look around you, I mean, when you live, live in a, a city like Bombay, there's so many funny things going on and just so quaint and, and particular to Indians. And they have a wonderful way of doing the ordinary, ordinary things, but just infusing them with um, a lot of quirks, which I find really entertaining. And I didn't intend to make it funny. It was just the way they were written. <laughs> and it just happened to be funny. You know, everyone's gone on about how observant you are. And I agree with, when I read the book, that was the first thing. There's so many, you know, acute observations of people. But I'm mystified about how you can get to observe these people. Because the residents of this Paradise Towers, which is like this, you know, ambitiously named perfect building, which is imperfect residence, it's a world very different from the world you occupy. And you don't have very much anonymity to go on the street and observe people. So how do you come up with these characters? Um, as everyone has said repeatedly, I've always been a very shy um, child. And growing up, I've been very shy too. So it always meant I was in the background. And there was always so much going on around the members of my family, different people who would come and visit, whether it was Diwali or Holi or birthdays. And it, it, it gave me a chance to observe people and and you know their, the way they behave, their body language, but you know peculiar um, traits they would have, and these things always stayed in my mind, and they found their way onto paper in Paradise Towers. You know, Truman Capote once said that all literature is gossip, and you seem to have taken that a lot to heart. A lot of this is about what people are whispering about other people, and the idea of you know changing uh, degrees of perception. So. Um, is that the kind of book you like reading as well? Is that is this more juicy and narrative? Is that your kind of style? It's not only the kind of book I write read, like reading, but again, huge influences from when you read anything by Jane Austen. She always has, you know, there's some kind of internal dialogue going Absolutely. on, specifically between the women, mm. and it's funny and it's engaging, and I think it draws you. Um, into the book and it, it sort of familiarizes you with the characters because they're doing human things. They're not supernatural. They're doing right. human things that you relate to and you do. So I think that's why, you know, <laughs> it's there. You know, this is a book that is a little more complicated than it seems, you know. When you pick it up, it starts out, it's very fresh and frothy. I would call it like, this is a mimosa with too much champagne, you know. This, <laughs> it's very bubbly, but it packs more of a kick than you might expect. Uh, it, you know, delves into depth and it delves into uh, human frailty and there is insecurity in the characters. So I'm curious to know what was your genesis for this? What was your starting germ that made you think, I will write a book about this building and these people? People have always fascinated me. Mm. It's, they're interesting to watch and specifically people in my country because they come from such different places and mindsets and ideologies and customs but when you put them all together they somehow get along and they manage to pull along and that's always fascinated me it's just such a, a country teeming with you know p people with different characters and characteristics also a lot of stereotypes mm. but sometimes they rise above them and sometimes but more than often they succumb to them sure and that in itself is so entertaining for me yeah it's fascinating <laughs> 
But was there one character that came first or one little bit of the storyline that came first and you thought, okay, I can build something around this? Uh, Not to give too much away to you know, people who haven't read the book. The building book. came first. Okay. The building came first. Right. Um, and then I had to people it. Hmm. And I drew from people I've met, some family members, mainly my Bengali side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and that's how it came about. And this is one section I just I picked out because it reads incredibly cinematically. You know? There are like there are bits of the book that read very much like a movie. You know, one bit that I really liked is about a policeman who's wiping his bald head using the same handkerchief with which he had previously handled evidence. So someone notices him doing this and he immediately ties it around his neck like a scarf. So this is a great it's a visually comic moment. It's right for the movies, you know. So coming from a film family, do you often find yourself like thinking cinematically, visually? Inadvertently, yes. Right. I think um, a lot of what we write is influenced by art, and that is cinema, that's pictures, um, what you watch, see on television, and today what you find on Instagram, and all of that. So yes, definitely. And are you already, like I'll beat Karan to this question, but are you already thinking of, you know, the Paradise Towers movie? Are you already... Imagining it? I don't know. I'm not <laughs> thinking of anything yet. I'm just happy the book is out there and I hope people enjoy it. <laughs> what was your uh, biggest challenge here as a writer? You know, because it's the first book. It's a very daunting thing. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of discipline. You know, it's a, it's a completely new thing for you to do. So what was the hardest? The discipline yeah. to actually sit down and, and write and... and that was it. The people were easy. It was, it was like I've known them all my life. They were friends. The story came to me, but it was the discipline of actually having to sit down and transfer what was in my head onto paper. Okay. And uh, have you been nervous about how people are reacting to the book? Have they been, uh, are you surprised by their reactions? I am very nervous, and um, yeah, I, I probably will be surprised. Right. Uh, before we open it up to questions, I just want to bring it back to the idea of the Paradise Towers movie. We are, you know, <laughs> we are in Bombay. We have everyone here. And I just want to see, do you picture some of these people uh, as actors while writing about them? Did you visualize anyone like that? No. 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 <laughs> and, and do you think this is going to be more a Zoya Akhtar movie or more a Karan Johar movie? Let me put you on the spot. I, I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> it's going to be a um, crossover. <laughs> okay. Quite noted. All right, let me take some questions from the audience. <laughs> Everyone's scared of going first. Yes, everybody, yes, everybody feels shy to ask questions, so I just think I have to offer it. <laughs> so, Shweta, you say you're nervous, but you are doing very well. And uh, we would like you to look at us also and answer, and not just look at Raja Sen, because we are feeling jealous. <laughs> so, you said that you're feeling nervous, but uh, there must be other things also that you're feeling at the moment. What was your first thought when you woke up? Nervous. This morning. I was just nervous. I, did, I couldn't think. And what did your mother say when she read the book? Should we hand the mic over yes, to her? Yes, please. No, 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 give the phone to her. No, no, you, you. <laughs> she, um, she said pretty much what everyone said is, how do you know the world of a building so well? You've never lived in one. And uh, she found it very visual. She found it uplifting, and uh, she said that in, in we're living in such troubled times, and it's nice to read a fresh, happy book like this, right? And what did Dad say? He's, Dad ma he, he's making his way through the book. <laughs> 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 no, he's making his way through some oh. of the pages. Okay. I've read portions of the book. Um, what actually uh, interested me and surprised me was the very minute details in describing something very ordinary. And I just love that. 
as she said in uh, while she was talking to Raja that uh, she found something extraordinary in even the littlest of moments. But how well to be able to design that in words, that was very fascinating for me. Right. I've been informed that we're running out of time here. But, uh, you know, Shweta is going to be signing books now. So we're not letting her off the hook just yet. So please uh, get your books and make her sign, you know, interesting individual dedications to all of you. Thank you. Thank you just to wish her good luck. And I, I'm surprised why she took so long to launch a book. She could do it much earlier also. <laughs> Better late than never. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. And that was truly a brave attempt to make Shweta to speak. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, you did well because she went beyond monosyllabic replies. So thank you so much. You did fantastically. Give it up for Raja Sen, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. And, We'd like to thank everyone at HarperCollins for making this momentous day possible, for actually putting out the book in such a beautiful manner. We'd like to thank uh, Shweta's, we'd like to thank uh, Shweta's parents, Amit Uncle and Auntie Jay, for doing the honors, for being on this platform with us and just being the people they are. Thank you so much. And yes, and uh, thank you, Shweta. Thank you for bringing us all together in this wonderful room full of love and happiness for you. Thank you, Karan. Thank you so much for being here for me. No, always. And uh, we have a request we could hold the book and post for pictures because that's what really matters eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Left side, left side. Yeah, 